So my name is Daniel Webster. Uh, you have a panelist of some really sort of great industry experts, minus Will James, who's not here, uh, because uh, he had to run off to um, Asia to uh, run a deal. So apologies for that. But uh, Adam has assured me that he'll um, deal with all massive things uh, and more besides. Uh, so the subject is building a sca scalable next generation uh, business, and two. And I'm going to start with just a sort of few brief introductory slides, just to sort of set the scene. Then I'm going to sort of introduce the panelists, or rather have them introduce themselves, uh, and then we're going to um, fire some questions back and forth and uh, leave enough time for Q and A. I've been instructed by the fine people in the back of the room that um, I need to repeat questions if uh, you ask questions so they can be captured for the bigger, wider audience that is out there on that internet thing. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a bit of fun and uh, perhaps uh, generate some interest in based off of the topics that we're talking about. So. Uh, I have the benefit of actually living the time span of this graph. Uh, I was born in 1959, and uh, I remember broadcast TV, uh, and in fact, we had one of the first color TVs in London, which is where I grew up, uh, which was out in the market back, uh, back then. But this graph is supposed to sort of represent the changing sort of world that we now sort of live in and the transition from, uh, in the US, the big three, you know, the major sort of networks into the sort of cable and direct TV uh, sort of world. And then, uh, as we know, the 2000s and the uh, takeoff of Netflix and YouTube and the like. The basic sort of premise is that we're now entering into uh, this so next phase, which is the green line, which is showing this massive sort of uplift in terms of IP traffic. And if anybody's looked at any of the Cisco uh, reports, you'll know, you know this is probably an under-exaggerated uh, piece of sort of information that mobile has grown immensely and basically connected video devices are everywhere. Uh, and it's a very fragmented audience. And we have a customer in India where we are literally uh, servicing video to over a thousand different Android versions of uh, mobile uh, phones. Uh, but the basic sort of premise is that uh, traditional sort of industries are struggling and uh, we're going into a new sort of generation and it's going to be one uh, where everybody in this room is going to sort of have a big role to sort of play. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this is the US, and basically uh, Netflix is surpassing all the major cable providers put together. And if you projected this out over the last two quarters, Q2 and Q3, uh, the numbers are actually even worse. And it's, um, it's, it's a very fast-changing world. Uh, and uh, as uh, traditional companies, they're trying to sort of figure out what to uh, do with this. Then there are new challenges coming along who are essentially uh, dealing with uh, the sort of challenges of that. And this is what this sort of panel is really about. It's talking about what are the challenges of building a scalable next generation TV service. So I've lumped them for the sake of simplicity into three big buckets, but we'll get more into the sort of details of them. And essentially, as I just sort of mentioned, you have this extremely fragmented TV experience. It, uh, you come to video in so many different sort of ways, and uh, quite frankly, it's a struggle uh, even for uh, digital natives, so to speak. Uh, it has to scale. It has to be, as was said in the morning sort of session, it has to be uh, TV only better. And I would you know, argue that it really has to be a lot better, and that's uh, really hard to do uh, given you know, the internet was primarily not designed, first and foremost, for streaming video. It's a packet technology, and there are fundamental problems around that. So uh, as a lot of you deal with that, it, this, is a, this is a problem which really needs to 
uh, be solved. It's being solved in lots of sort of different ways, but it's going to be a challenge uh, as the whole sort of space scales uh, considerably. Uh, content is extremely expensive, uh, not least driven by what Amazon and Netflix are doing uh, in terms of trying to gain sort of uh, market position, be the dominant sort of players in the sort of space, and they're driving up the uh, price of uh, content. And as a result, uh, us as technology companies, I assume most of you are from technology companies, have to fight for that share of wallet. And they have to fight for that share of wallet in a time when uh, the, profit, um, the profit models, the business models of all those companies are being fundamentally uh, challenged. It's, it's, it's a very different world. It's not a monopolistic world where you have a secure distribution path and you can control uh, who sees that and as a result the business model around it, and we'll talk more about that, um, it's highly fragmented. There's high churn rates. Uh, you know, YouTube TV it has no lock-ins. You can have it one day, you can not have it the next day. It's a very, very different world. Uh, and we live still in a generation which was based on the principle of a lot of failure of content creation, uh, and it was a very, it's a very high-cost uh, world where, um, quite frankly, there's a lot of inefficiency, but it created the majority of the content that we know and love today. And that's being exacerbated by uh, Amazon and Netflix desire to essentially grow and make sure that uh, they are the last ones sort of standing uh, and they're driving the price of content uh, exceptionally high. A lot of the companies that uh, we work with and deal with uh, really have a challenge with dealing with uh, legacy equipment, uh, which is out there because of the first and the second sort of wave and generation of that. And there's immense costs associated with that. If you speak to any uh, telco, the, the set-top boxes that they have out in the field, their ability from a processor uh, chipset standpoint to basically deal with the demands of the new user experiences are very, uh, are very limited. But they have thousands, millions of people connected to those experiences, and they've got to figure out how to uh, hold on to those uh, audiences while transitioning to new means of sort of delivery. And the problem just goes on and on. And you know, as everybody knows, probably in this room, the cost of rolling a truck is extremely expensive and the cost associated with it. So fundamentally, the business models are being exceptionally sort of turned upside down. So by way of introduction, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to now give the majority of the time over to the panel. and. Um, if you feel so inclined, uh, the guys in the back room might not be cool with this, you know, raise your hand, ask a question. We'd like it to be as interactive as uh, possible. Uh, I will leave some time at the end to uh, sort of, in a more sort of orderly way, take questions. But if you have a burning question, ask it. So uh, let me just go down the panel, have everybody sort of introduce themselves, and uh, I'd like you to also just Give us one word which you think sort of symbolizes, represents the challenges that we're facing you know, when it comes to scale. Mm -hmm. Felix. Good morning, everybody. I'm Felix Gomez, Vice President at Yumi. We help advertisers find their intended audiences on connected devices, predominantly on OTT, CTV devices, uh, with sight, sound, and motion. I guess the word I'm going to throw out today is technology. Titus. My name is Titus Bicknell. I'm Chief Digital Officer for RLJ Entertainment. Uh, we run uh, a very traditional distribution business that in the last few years has evolved into a direct-to-consumer SVOD platform. And we serve north of half a million customers uh, on those SVOD services. And the word I would throw out, I confess it's an acronym, not a word, KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. And Adam. Hi, Adam Deep, uh, Client Solutions. Uh, I head Client Solutions for Own Zones Media. We, uh, we call ourselves a tri-bid um, company. We have our 
digital media services, which is uh, media logistics, getting files from studios over to uh, their OTT platforms, as well as a unified app framework. Uh, and we also have our own uh, and operated uh, SVOD channels and things like that to uh, direct to consumers. And we do other things where we're distributing for content producers and, and merchandising and marketing. And the, the one word that I would emphasize is logistics. Technology, KISS, logistics. So, Adam, I'm going to sort of start with you for the first sort of question. So, my wife is a big, long-time, third-generation, L.A. native Dodgers fan. <laughs> it's raining today because the city is crying for the Dodgers. So, um, uh, it was not a particularly good night at home last, uh, yesterday. But uh, every time she comes to the TV, uh, she basically asks, why doesn't this just work like TV? Uh, we pay $130 a month to Time Warner for the one reason to watch the Dodgers network. <laughs> No other reason. Everything else is watched on Netflix or Amazon, and, the, and you know, she struggles every time she comes to the TV, basically has to go and find me, to switch it over from uh, the Netflix uh, input on our Samsung smart TV to the cable box and all of that. Uh, my question, Adam, is you know, both from a usability but also from a scalability standpoint, you know, when is TV, when is this modern digital video experience going to be as simple as TV, which we grew up and lived with for the last 50 years? Well, I can't really answer when, but will it eventually <laughs> be as good as TV? I would say yes. And uh, I would even argue to say that it will, uh, the experience will even be better than your traditional broadcast television, right? Uh, you know, you know, if you remember back in the days when digital satellite, you know, just came on, right? You're switching channels. Remember, like, there's that, that delay, right? So you still had that delay, and people got better in, uh, at the, you know, with the latency and things like that. But you know, the reason why I was mentioning logistics before is that when you're at a conference like this, they talk about end to end, but the the vendors or whoever they're talking to, they define what that end to end is. But really, beyond those end to end is your digital supply chain, if you will. That's why I was saying so logistics. Well. You know, what happens from the, from the actual cameraman all the way up to the ingest, right? So like Amazon was talking uh, earlier today, it's like, oh yeah, you feed into us whatever you want to feed into, we process it and we do all these great things with adaptive bitrate streaming and then get to all your end devices. Well, anywhere along that chain could be problematic, but even before you get in there, it's like, well, what about getting that signal there? Yeah, the uplinks to your satellite, downlink from your satellite, well, with technology, you can actually bypass some of those things. Now that IP is all over the world now, it's like you don't need a satellite uplink and downlink anymore, uh, you know, so, which therefore reduces cost, and then you can put more, you know, more efforts into more pops or more uh, you know, better you know, content delivery um, solutions. Right? So there's a lot, technology can solve a lot of it, but you know, um, service providers, you know, they need to take a more of a uh, macro level look at their entire chain from what, what we call glass to glass. Right, the glass of the camera, all the way to the glass of your device, and if you look at that, you'll see where some of the bottlenecks are, and you can, you know, you can then look at where those bottlenecks are, and then influence it either with better technology or a better user experience wherever you might find that bottleneck. So, Titus, do you really think it's getting easier? I mean, it used to be you threw up a transmitter, it broadcast to a particular sort of area, mm -hmm. and you know, you had an antenna. By the way, the new generation just rediscovering antennas. They actually work pretty well. <laughs> yes. um, you know, it, it, there seem to be a lot of moving parts. You run Acorn TV, uh, you know, deliver very traditional content, which both you and I love, yep. um, of a new technology. Uh, is it working? Will it be simplified, your key? you know, word acronym was KISS, mm -hmm. will it get really simple? So I think to, to look at the, the two elements of the original question, I've never lived in a home where there wasn't a confusion over the number of remotes. I mean, even before they were remotes, 
there was a confusion over which button do I press to go from this piece of content to that piece of content. And the, the cynic in me believes that actually all hardware manufacturers and content providers enjoy the fact that it's difficult because that's how you create engagement. That is to say, lazy engagement. I can't find out how to change the channel, so I'm just going to keep watching it. Um, so I don't believe that we're in a golden age of the unified remote. I mean, those things have been on the market for as long as I've been alive, and they don't ever seem to work. You always have lost some piece of the, the technical experience. Um, the more important point, though, is I think if you serve your audience with content that they believe they're always going to have some relationship to, they don't care where the remote is because they're not going to turn off. And in a sense, the SVOD equivalent to the prime time programming window is the same answer to the question of choice. People actually don't want as much choice as they have. And if you can curate content well, that's how you lead to brand loyalty. To the other end of the question, uh, I believe we're all in an industry where the, the best analogy is the swan. You know, above the surface, it, need, it needs to look graceful and elegant and seamless and effortless. But we all know that below the surface, we're kicking like crazy. Um, and the reason I threw the, the acronym KISS out there is that my world is so complicated in terms of getting content from its original source through to a very disparate audience spread across the United States predominantly who are not tech savvy. You know, our demo is skews very old. Um, and they're interested in not having to worry about how to get content. They're worried about, I want to get it as fast as possible and as well as possible. And so a large part of what we do is, in a sense, decomplicate to the best of our ability. Um, and so a large part of our effort is ensuring that the user experience changes as little as possible and that it is predictable as possible. And as we all know in this room, that's very hard to do. Uh, I guess just pick up on the question and just go sure. with it. And <laughs> well, first and foremost, I need your uh, Time Warner contact because I'm paying almost double what you're paying, <laughs> which is ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, to your point, you know, I think you know, I always use a case study of, of one myself, and the only reason I still have cable is due to sports, right? I like to watch my Lakers and Dodgers. But if we look at, at this question, I dissect it from a silo perspective to a scalable perspective. Right now, I believe from a silo perspective, we're already there from a SVOD or on-demand technology standpoint in terms of viewing experience. And what I mean by that is, if you look at HBO Go, right, they've done a very effective job of making sure that we don't miss out on the water cooler effect. And what I mean by that is, you know, when Game of Thrones airs now in, East, in Eastern Standard Time, I can now put it, watch it on my app, stream it from my Apple, Apple phone to my Apple TV at the same time that people are watching in New York, right? So they're creating these on-demand fingertip experiences that we can have the content that anywhere, anyone else in the world is having. But when we look at a scalable solution, everything is so fragmented, right? Because there are no operating systems across these OTT devices, across these smart televisions. So if I'm Hulu, I have to build a specific app for LG, for Samsung, for the gaming consoles. It gets very expensive, and that goes to your point where when you look under the hood, it's not pretty, right? It's, it's a kit, it's a Ferrari kit, but when you look under the hood, there's a lot going on with a lot of guinea pigs, guinea pigs spinning a lot of different wheels. Um, but once we figure out how we can scale across all these different platforms, I believe it's going to get a lot more effective and a lot better. OK, Felix, I'm going to stick with you, because the next question is about money. Sure. <laughs> uh, I sort of alluded to some of those points up there. But you know, fundamentally, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a media company, a telco, or even a, you know, a new entity, whatever you want to call it, a virtual MVP, you know, depending on which part of the world you're in, gets different names. Uh, they're all struggling with a business model. You have Amazon up here, who mm -hmm. basically you know, is an everything company, and media just happens to be one of those. Uh, it, it, it can afford to lose uh, tons of money on its video uh, projects, and it has. Um, and uh, Jeff has somehow convinced Wall Street not to care about margin, you know, and the traditional sort of measures of, you know, uh, valuation, and he's doing a great job of it. Regulation may trip him up at some point, but save that, you know. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it's pretty hard to imagine. And it's sort of a failure. And you've got to sort of think about perhaps the new media company of the future isn't, in fact, a media company. So sort of pose that as one question. And then, you know, you look at Netflix. It's barely, marginally uh, making money. And it's investing a lot up front in order to try and sort of gain that um, lead sort of position. Uh, so you've got a bunch of big players who can invest. And then you've got a bunch of smaller players who I would like to believe have a good chance because they have great niche content. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, the economic, the new economic model for media still has to be found. You're front and center in the advertising world. You know, as you know, you've got an advertising model, you've got a subscription model. Rarely the twain do meet. Uh, there are very few examples. What's your sort of, if you put your crystal ball out there and hope that it doesn't uh, fall and crash, what's your sort of uh, prediction of how this is going to play out? Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're on our way of repeating history. And what I mean by that is the first slide that you showed, right, went back to 1959. We're talking about the big three and then eventually the big four. So if you want to create your own big three or big four, you can put Netflix, Amazon, Hulu's. Apple TV just announced that they're going to, they're going to invest $7 billion in original content, right? Roku just announced that they're going, to build, they're going to invest a lot in original content because 70% of their viewing comes from Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. So they're not making money off that, right? But to your point, there is a need for those niche audiences, and that's when we're going to repeat history with cable, right? You have, you have partners like Tubi TV or Pluto TV um, that are go, uh, going out there and aggregating these niche, these niche channels for niche audiences where there is the, the need for those eyeballs, right? And so at the end of the day, we're still going to be battling the big four, big three, whatever you want to call them. But if we have the ability to go and scale and bring quality content to our end consumers, then there's going to be an opportunity for everybody. To your point regarding subscription versus non-subscription base, right? I think that um, Netflix has done a fantastic job. Right before Stranger Two, just Stranger Things Two just came out, they increased their monthly subscriptions, and no one balked at it because they did it in a strategic manner where people wanted to watch Stranger Things Two. But I think if if you look at what we call the, the mass reach partners in this space that's going to give us those aggregated channels or whatever that may be, they're going to be able to make money from an ad-supported standpoint. Right? They're not going to be, may not play in the subscription base, but where their bread and butter is going to be within those 15 and 30 second linear TV commercial pods. Titus, is it ever going to become so personalized that you, know, you can get value out of those advertising and those subscription sort of things based off of uh, really d deriving real-time value ar around users? So we, we're taking a slightly different approach, um, which is to say it, if you can get the cost base low enough and you can curate the content well enough, you're not having to create, as it were, content discovery systems within your environment. Um, we run, relative to Netflix, a tiny library. And the argument we make to our customers is, we've already done the surf Netflix for an hour and then go to bed for you. You don't have to do that. Anything you turn on on our service is something you're likely to find value in. Now, we, through the complexity of rights windowing, don't have any AVOD opportunities. So we're not really interested in trying to leverage um, the marketing or advertising side of it. We're also aware from the more traditional businesses that the demo we aim for is not very attractive to advertisers. And this is where some of the, the big channels who appeal with the kind of content that we have in a more broadcast and traditional sense are struggling because they're not finding that they can make the advertising dollars off of the ratings that they're getting. Um, long way of saying, I believe that is the cost of delivering a service which is quote unquote as good as television is so low, the barrier to entry is almost non-existent because you can basically have OTT as a service at this point. That if you have meaningful content and you know your target demo, chances are you can find them and you can make money. Adam. Well, there, you know, I, I would segment the, my, my answer into like uh, different um, audience, right? If you know, back when I was uh, working at a CDN with Daniel, uh, I can actually predict if a channel's uh, going to be successful in 18 months. 
Because what happens if it, I ask them one qualifying question when I'm working with those customers, like, hey, you're building a new uh, TV service. Okay, well, you know, how big is your sales team? You know, what are you doing in terms of justifying that, you know, uh, like, justifying the cost of implementing this TV solution. And those who say, oh no, we're, we're, we're aggregating all this content, this is great co content, content is king, and we're gonna great, create this really great experience, and when, when that happens, then we're gonna go to an ad network. I can predict within 18 months that they will shut, their, shut at stores or pivot or does, or does something, because after that first 12 month contract where they're, you know, where they're delivering some sort of service, they, they chalk it to, oh, we're a startup, it's a new service, so they're okay with losing money. But then, six months down the next contract, or uh, following contract, they realize this is not sustainable, and then they have to pivot or find something else. The ones who do well are the ones who it says, yeah, we already have uh, you know, another presence or another property that's a web property, it's, it's a blog site that gets you know, 30 million hits, we're just simply adding video to, you know, and then turning this into a different channel. They already have the ad networks. They already have the monetization. They're already working with you, me, and you know, and all these other ad uh, providers, so that when they do launch a TV uh, experience, which is yes, technology is fairly inexpensive, and these days the per gigabyte's cheap. It's still so expensive to deliver. Imagine a million people watching a piece of content, right? You know, in, in HD. Well, how are you gonna you know uh, curb that cost? Well, you got to have your your sales and in your um, your revenue streams kind of defined and that strategy built in. And if not, then you're gonna sink, right? So. A quick question to the audience because it impacts my next question. Uh, how many people by a show of hands are on the sort of technology vendor side of things? And content creators, okay, pretty 50-50, I'm somewhat Surprised? Okay. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, so um, I'd like to sort of just go down the panel and you know perhaps pick up on your sort of keywords, uh, technology, kiss, logistics, and you know just provide for the audience who you now know intimately, based off of their show of hands, um, some basic sort of fundamental the top five things that they should know in terms of uh, top three, pick your number. Uh, they, they should sort of think about in terms of sort of best practices of either building out a business um, in this sort of new digital sort of world um, and or you know, uh, providing sort of technology uh, to the companies that are trying to sort of build those businesses. And obviously there's a in a section because if you're trying to provide those technologies to those companies, you have to sort of understand how they're going to be successful uh, anyway. So um, I'm going to go to the middle now. Titus? Um, so first and foremost, don't do anything you can't measure. Um, the, the key principle of what I have meant by KISS is, in, in the words of Dolly Parton, it takes a lot of money to look this cheap. and it's very hard work to make your solution look and feel simple. So make sure that anything that you're doing, whether it's a particular piece of technology, uh, a particular piece of marketing, a particular piece of branding, you can measure exactly how it works. I think the beauty we have in the SVOD space is that we have a availability of data and access to information about how our audience is engaging with us that none of the traditional providers have had in this 50 year span we've talked about. They've relied on the, the Nielsen's of the world to give them a sense of how well they're doing, but Nielsen numbers as we know are sampled from a very small set of users. I know data about every single person who watches my service, not just a sampling. So I can really drill down and go, okay, that piece of content worked, that piece of content continued to work, that piece of content made it to a second season and still worked, now I might actually commission a third season because I know how well it performed with my audience. We have a really good example at the moment of a season. Tr traditional model for us is these shows are made by British, Australian, Canadian broadcasters from a funding perspective, and we then buy windows that allow us to exploit them in SVOD and home entertainment spaces. So we, we saw a show, it rated pretty well, it had good critical reviews, came to our service, was the most watched thing on our service in six months. The UK broadcaster didn't pick it up for a second season. 
because as far as they were concerned, it was not a success. We go to the producer, we say, we'll fund it, because we know we can make a success of it. And that's an access to data that we're disproportionately able to change our business on the basis of. So that was, that was the first, probably the, the first and most critical piece of it. Um, from a content provider's perspective, the only advice I would throw out there is, to Daniel's point, the big three are spending an awful lot of money to keep your content out of the market. You know, if you made a film or a TV series five years ago, you could expect to have maybe a theatrical window or a TV broadcast, certainly a direct-to-video VOD experience, some tail in, in home entertainment, and then the great gravy train of SVOD exclusive and, and third-party non-exclusive to, to work through. SVOD, if you do a deal with Netflix, they're putting a ton of money on the table to take you out of 90% of those windows. And if you make content, that's not a good thing. They will drop your piece of content into an ocean of content, and it may or may not get visibility. So I would just make the point that if you can work with an organization that has exploitation across wider windows, chances are your content value and visibility will increase, even if the check on the first day is not as big. I'll stop there. Adam. So a couple of things I would like look at, and like like I mentioned before, the media logistics, right? If you look at the recent uh, failures, right, with a lot of the the you know, in the past, even as recent as last week's with the World Series games on Hulu, right? Or you look at you know, a couple of years back, even Apple couldn't do their their live stream well. Is it's not because of their CDN. It wasn't because of their video platform. If you look at their whole holistic approach from end to end, they realized oh it was a Twitter feed. It was like oh this app inadvertently you know, cause a crash on their servers so all the requests couldn't even come in so that you can't even get to the CDN to deliver those streams. So if you took a, a bigger approach, like from end to end, you can kind of you know, predict, or well not predict, but at least address potential bottlenecks so that you don't have uh, you know, a, a down period. So when I say media logistics, you, know, you gotta look, it, it's like treat you know, these virtual digital packets as like, commoditized real physical uh, products. Like, how does it go from one partner to another? If you utilize different uh, technology partners or vendors, you know, there's gonna be that handoff and there, that's a potential uh, failure point there, right? Um, the other piece is that if you have any part of a uh, technology is continue to iterate. Um, like right now, people are saying, oh, uh, with live streaming, their latency, oh yeah, it's never gonna be as good as cable. Well, I've talked to you know, I've, you know, technology partners that can actually you know, switch between 4K channels as fast or faster than cable, right? And the technology's there, and I was like, well, does it scale? Oh yeah, it's scale because it's on multiple clouds, not just one cloud. Some people think, oh, I have my technology, it's on AWS, it's on Azure or Google you know, cloud, I'm, I'm good, right? It's gonna scale. Well, you know, there's enough stories about Amazon failing because of one line of code that the storage doesn't work and then your whole service is down, right? So you gotta iterate with the newer technologies if you are you know, having that. But if you're partnering, make sure your partner iterates technology as well. Because we're talking about next generation TV experience. There's always gonna be a next generation of technology and you have to keep up with that. Felix, you get the final word before I throw it out. Uh, up. Yeah, I think, I think I'm gonna first and foremost you know, put my advertising hat on and, and echo what Adam said. If you have an opportunity to drive revenue, drive revenue immediately. Because a lot of the big four, whatever we wanna call them in this new age, they're taking money left and right. And you know, we work with probably about five to 600 different OTT partners, whether that's the OTT directs or specific apps. And we get daily outreaches asking for them to join our network so we can serve 15 or 30 second spots so we can drive revenue for them. Um, unfortunately, I've seen friends in the industry and, and other colleagues that have failed because they, they didn't want to include advertising or some type of revenue stream into their, into their programming and it's very important because that's what's going to pay the bill. So if you have an opportunity to drive revenue, certainly drive revenue. Um, secondly, find your niche, right? And what I mean by that is if you're creating snackable content for millennials, focus on that and do it well. If you're doing long form episodic work, then focus on that. You know, I think what, one of my favorite quotes is what Warren Buffett says is, he's made a lot of money um, knowing a lot about a little versus knowing a little about a lot, right? And so if we focus, we put our head down and we, we, we tailor to our audiences, then we should be successful. And last but not least, very critical is focus on the end user, which is a consumer, right? And if you have a UI, if you have a user, user interface, whether that's an app or an OTT, make sure that it's seamless and flawless. Make sure that it's, it's for lack of better terminology, sexy. 
Um, if, if for those that have seen an Amazon Fire, it's very sleek. It's very, it's very smooth, right? You want to you wanna go on your Amazon Fire, because guess what? I can now order on it, but then I can watch Mozart in the Jungle Season 2, right? We've gone to some, some interfaces, and we've all seen that experience, where they're clunky. They're slow. It's not appealing to us. So if you focus on, it, on your interface and you find your niche, then you're going to drive revenue ultimately. I want to open it up for questions. We've got about uh, seven minutes. Ten minutes. Uh, I saw a hand over here. Sorry. So, so let me just quickly yeah. uh, repeat the question because otherwise somebody's going to yell at me. <laughs> uh, um, sorry if I don't get it exactly right. Um, so for Titus at Acorn, uh, essentially they uh, acquired the rights to niche content. Uh, the deal basically got turned on its head and you decided to fund the production of that. Can you afford it? So I think, I think the key to that being possible for us is that we're not purely an SVOD provider. We are still a distributor in the traditional sense. So we represent all of the windows. And what that means is that we're able to, in essence, debt finance production because we know that we have outlets that across a, a full spectrum are going make it, to make it work financially. It, it is certainly true that at the outset of Acorn TV, our subscriber base was small. And so the conversation internally was, do we hold it for our own subscribers or do we sell it to Netflix or Amazon or Hulu? And in the early days, the conversation was always, why would you wake, walk away from that huge amount of money to put it on something where you have a small number of subs? There is obviously a tipping point. There's a magic moment where you feel as though you have enough there to take the risk of leaving money on the table because you believe that's going to drive customer acquisition. And then you get to another wonderful moment, which is where we are now, of saying that subscriber base can cover a large enough percentage of a commissioning budget that if we put that on the table with the other windows we know we can exploit and other rights we can sell, the whole deal works. But yeah, it's essentially turning us into a very different kind of business in a very short period of time. But it's not because the financing is entirely funded by SVOD. Would you mind elaborating on that spectrum then? Just a couple of examples. So we know that if we make it, we've then got global TV rights. And so we can sell those TV rights in 15 different countries. That offsets some of the cost. We still do wholesale physical and EST. So we have physical window. We do distribution of, of DVDs globally and uh, Blu-ray. And we know that a lot of the content, even though it goes exclusive to SVOD Acorn first, we still have the opportunity to make money out of a third party SVOD window. So a second window. Which sometimes that. Correct. And what's also interesting, we found that if you launch something in SVOD where you do have an audience, you actually create a higher price point for the TV window as a second window. Because you can go to the TV broadcaster and say, nobody's ever heard of this. Maybe you take it and then we make money later on. They go, no, 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 I can show you the viewer stats for this. This has an audience. And that's been a really interesting change in the business, where it's the, the waterfall of Windows has become a, you know, a spin cycle, basically, <laughs> because you're never quite sure which one's going to lead and create value and interest in the market. It's an, it's an interesting question. So you know, as you balance technology to drive all of this, you know, I'm reminded of sort of saying content is king, but also distribution is arguably the kingdom. And you've got to sort of you know, play with all of those different sort of levers yep. in order to produce an effective uh, outcome. And I talk a lot about this being the era of experimentation. And I sort of believe that a lot of people are sort of playing around with trying to find that right balance, both you know, on the technology sort of side of things, but also on the, you know, uh, direct-to-consumer side of things, so how to make money in this new age. Other questions? If 
Sorry. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could, because I know that all of you have different perspectives, but the, the, the intersection and difference of an S broad model and a C broad model, because I know that some, there's a lot of companies that are trying to carve out their own niche and not necessarily trying to compete with the big boys, but it's a big decision, right? To decide whether you want to go subscription versus on demand and how to scale it properly. I'll answer that very quickly. I think you need to have the tool set to basically do three, all three plus. And, and you know, there's no right answer. And, and also you have different sets of audiences. You know, my kids don't earn a lot of money and they have more time and the audience and the advertisers want them. So they're gonna be perfectly happy getting streamed ads all the time for free content. Mm -hmm. I make a little bit more money. <laughs> I, pre I, I uh, really, uh, you know, uh, want to use my time wisely, so I pay for comedians. Uh, well, I would look at it like even, like, technology side, it's easy to switch between SVOD, AVOD, or TVOD, right? But uh, something that I personally experience and is, is that, you know, if you focus on the marketing merchandising of your content, so for example, Thor Ragnarok's coming out today, tomorrow, right? Everyone might, is gonna go watch it, right? Or a good number of people. But say some people might wanna go back and watch the whole series of, of films that lead up to it. Avengers, for example, is not on any subscription VOD services today. You have to subscribe to it, right? So I think that's, I think if someone's out there and they purposely did, did it, maybe it's an accident, but if I was in control of that, I would purposely make it so that, okay, it's not on Netflix, their window, their rotating windows are out, it's not on HBO or Stars or anything else. You have to buy it from my, you know, TVOD service or on Amazon or whatever. And so, you know, because people want to catch up to that episode, right? And I've actually seen examples of this several times where, oh, I, you know, I want to see the first version of the sequel before the sequel, and it's never available. Of course, when I don't want to watch it, it's always on Netflix or, Amazon Prime or whatever it is. So I think there's something there. <laughs> but I think that could actually be worked into your, your strategy. So again, from that whole, you know, taking that macro level view, it's not like, okay, now I have a, a, an OTT service, I'm done. Now you gotta look at marketing your channel and then, mar you know, and, and curating the content and rotating it so that it actually, uh, you know, aligns to a higher revenue stream. That's a, that's a really good point. A prime example of that is an, an app called Musi and it's owned by Scripps. And Musi is, they, they call themselves a news station for millennials. And they're now actually bringing it to TVOD, uh, right? So they started on the OTT, and sure, they had a little bit more backing from scripts, but they went the non-traditional route where they said, let's focus on being successful where eyeballs are going. Now, we got to remember that 80% of all males 18 plus and 78% of all females 18 plus own some sort of OTT or connected device that they stream now in the US, right? Um, baby boomers are, are, the, are the biggest sector growing right now, with now 68% of all baby boomers owning an OTT device, right? So the, the market's gonna be there, but if you focus what, New, what Newsy's done is, you know, they started first where the, t where the eyeballs are moving. They said, okay, let's conquer this, and now let's move back to the traditional channel so we have coverage across all screens, right? Um, so that's a prime example, a great example of how that's been successful for them. Sorry. The only other thing I would add to that is human beings are hoarders. We, we like to collect things. And I think it's very easy to miss the opportunity where somebody engages with content on one of those formats, whether it's S or A, and then goes, I like that so much, I want to own it. And it's kind of the, the, the digital equivalent of the cable beauty of selling your product twice, right? You, you get cable sub and you get advertising revenue, is the ability to say, we are going to introduce you or get you engaged in a kind of content, and then as a collector, we're going to make it available to you on TVOD. The, the reason I say that is if you, if you look at the kind of buy box experience that's coming across all of Amazon Prime, almost every piece of content, there'll be an opportunity to buy it outright or get access to it through one of their streaming, streaming partners. And every single time, you'd think, why would anybody buy this outright? Because the streaming price is always cheaper. And you do the math, your lifetime value of a customer only has to be three months and you've made the same amount of money for that piece of content. Now, it has to aggregate and you have to amortize it across the content library. But what's fascinating that we're seeing is you get somebody who comes to that buy box moment, becomes a subscriber, and then three months later, they buy it as well. I'm like, wow, 
That's brilliant. So I would say don't overlook that some of those windows, even with an individual user, are going to be multiple use, just not when you expect it necessarily. That's sure to date. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's expensive to run it as your own service if you want to do TVOD and SVOD. But if your third party distribution deals allow and you can get into one of those spaces where they'll offer S or T alongside it, then it's a matter of rights. I mean, there is always going to be the challenge of somebody saying, I can't afford T as well as S rights, so I have to make a decision about what my primary model is, in which case I might just buy an SVOD window. Uh, we've run out of time. I'd like you to join me in thanking the panel for uh, uh, excellent thoughts. <laughs>